everybody, welcome to our Google Hangout today. Uh, I want to start by thanking everyone who has submitted questions for our panelists today. We brought together four experts who are going to take questions from our Voto Latino audience, so I'd like to introduce them. I'll start out with Mayra Alvarez. Mayra is the Associate Director for the Office of Minority Health at the Department of Health and Human Services. Mayra coordinates uh, her office's work related to the Affordable Care Act, and she is a veteran of our Google Hangouts. We're so glad to have her back. And most of all, Mayra is a powerful advocate for minority communities and their health. So Mayra, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Okay, next we have uh, Daniel Zingale. Daniel is the Senior Vice President of the California Endowment, of Healthy California at the California Endowment. Before that, he was Chief of Staff to Maria Shriver and a Senior Advisor to Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, whose name might ring a bell. Um, he's also um, a former Executive Director of AIDS Action in Washington, D.C., and former Political Director of the Human Rights Campaign, so his portfolio is, is quite varied. And on top of all that, he studied theology at Harvard University School of Divinity, so um, a man of many, of many talents. Welcome, Daniel, to our panel today. Thank you. Yeah. Next up, we have uh, Berta Alicia Guerrero, or B, as we like to call her. Uh, B is the National Director of Advocacy for the Hispanic Federation, um, and she's based here in Washington, D.C. In addition to working on healthcare issues, she works on immigration, on education, the environment, civil rights, uh, you name it, uh, B's passionate about it, and mostly her goal is to promote policies that improve the quality of life for Hispanic Americans in the U.S. Thanks for being with us, B. Thanks, Andy. Pleasure. Yeah. Next up, we have Kashif Sied. Kashiv is uh, the Reproductive Justice Fellow with Advocates for Youth, another one of our, our great partners on our health campaign. He is a 2013 law grad, and um, he is responsible right now for policy areas relating to young people's confidential access to sexual and reproductive health services. Kashiv, we're really glad to have you today. Thank you so much. So as many of you know, uh, open enrollment ended on March 31st, and um, for those who aren't familiar with that terminology, when I say open enrollment, it's the, the period to sign up for affordable health care um, under the new affordable health care law. Um, the deadline to sign up was March 31st, and we hope that many of you were able to. We know that over 8 million Americans enrolled, including millions of Latinos, many of whom are now insured for the very first time. So we know that this law has already benefit, benefited the community, uh, and we're, we're excited to, to work on more changes that will improve the lives of many more people. Um, the questions today came from social media, from text messages, from emails, from the Voto Latino audience. So again, thank you so much to each of you who submitted a question. Uh, there's no way we could put these panels together without without your input, and we're really glad that um, that you that you sent us that information. Um, so these new these new health plans that that many people are now enrolled in are are different. They're in different price levels. They um, they they're based in different locations. They're from different insurance company. But because of the Affordable Care Act, all of them are now required to cover in, to cover certain core benefits. Maida, can you tell us a little bit about what those are? And then Kashif, can you can you add a little bit more after that? Sure, sure, absolutely. Sorry, getting my uh, technical difficulties out of the way. No problem. Uh, Thanks. So definitely, um, you know, one of the great things about the Affordable Care Act is that you have access to health insurance that's of high quality, of, at good prices, and that covers the services you need. Um, and that includes a package of essential health benefits. All of the private health insurance plans that are offered in the marketplace will offer this same set of essential health benefits. Um, and just for folks to be clear, it's services um, that we know every day and think about every day as needing as part of our health care needs. Things like um, outpatient care that you need to get without being admitted to the hospital. Um, emergency services, hospitalization services, like if you get surgery and need to stay in the hospital, uh, maternity care, newborn care, mental health and substance use disorder services, and that includes behavioral health treatment, but also prescription drug coverage if you need it, or rehabilitative and habilitative services um, that need to be covered in case you may need it at some point in your lifespan. Laboratory services, those tests that need to get covered, those are also included, as well as preventive services, wellness services, which I know Kasha will elaborate on, and finally, pediatric services. 
they really are a set of benefits that are the minimum requirements for all of the plans. So there are plans in the marketplace that may go above and beyond this set of benefits. But you can rest assured that all of the plans will at least have this core of 10 essential health benefits. Thank you, Myra. And just to follow up, so Myra talked about how the Affordable Care Act requires that private insurers cover preventive services without imposing a copay or de deductible on the patient. And so uh, th those preventative services include critically important sexual and reproductive health services for groups who need them most. So for example, STI and HIV counseling and screening um, for women sexually active ad adolescents and at-risk adults, um, birth control including all FDA approved contraceptive methods, education and counseling for women about birth control, um, HPV immunization and cervical cancer screenings for women, again, crucial services. And, and finally, I'd like to mention that prenatal visits and other pregnancy-related care and counseling are also included in that set of preventive services that the ACA uh, mandates private health plans cover without copay and without deductible. So these services are completely covered when accessing care from in-network providers through non-grandfathered plans. And I think Myra will talk about grandfathered plans a little bit more later, but basically a set of plans uh, that uh, you know, predate um, implementation of the ACA that are getting smaller by, uh, by, the, by the month. So. Thanks so much for that, for that, um, Maida and Kashif. I guess really the question I should have asked you is what isn't covered because that might have been shorter. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And um, speaking to that topic, our next question comes from one of our viewers who's wondering about more specific coverage options. His question is, do all marketplace plans, um, and marketplace plans are those that uh, were bought through the, um, the health insurance marketplace, which is the, the government website to, to sign up for health care, um, do all marketplace plans cover things like hearing aids, CPAP machines for those with sleep apnea, and other hardware items? Uh, Maida, can you help us with that one? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. And I think it, it brings to mind a question that a lot of people that may have a pre-existing condition, a certain illness, uh, want a certain medication, they are wondering what plans cover what services and what treatments. Um, so I think the, the best piece of advice is to make sure you're checking with that insurance company to be clear on what's covered. We just talked about that package of 10 essential health benefits, and those are very broad categories that the plans generally cover. But if you have a specific need, if you need a specific drug, or if you need a specific device, it's important to, to be informed and check with the insurance company so that you're making an educated decision about the best plan for you and your health care needs. That's what the marketplace is about, presenting information to you in a clear to understand format so that you're better educated and informed when you're making the choice of your health insurance company. Thank you, Maida. Um, so the, the short answer to this question is check with your health insurance. Um, thank you so much for explaining that a little bit further, Maida. Uh, so I mentioned that more than 8 million Americans uh, were insured through the Affordable Health Care Act in this first period of open enrollment which is really, really wonderful. In addition to that, almost 5 million people received coverage through Medicaid or the CHIP program, the Children's Health Insurance Program. Um, B, can you help us a little bit to, to talk about enrollment for these programs? Is it, was there a deadline for that? Um, is this ongoing? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Anadi. Actually, um, you can apply and enroll for Medicaid and CHIP today. Any time of the year, there is no limited enrollment period for it. If you qualify, your coverage can begin almost immediately. Um, some of the qualifications are based on income and family size, and some states, such as California, have actually expanded on Medicaid to cover more people. To find out more, whether you'd be available, whether you'd qualify for Medicaid, um, you can visit your state's Medicaid website. You can also visit your local Department of um, Social Services, and at times, um, pregnant women and children can apply at clinics and hospitals and provider offices. So we're definitely encouraging everyone to take advantage of a Medicaid and CHIP today. Thanks, B. Uh, you mentioned California. Um, we know that California has actually surpassed its goal for Medi-Cal enrollment, and Medi-Cal is the, the name that Medicaid has in the state of California. 
Um, Daniel, since you're based in California, can you tell us a little bit about what California did to be successful in, in enrolling Californians into this program? Sure. So more than three million of those uh, national newly covered people you were talking about happened here in California. And it wasn't always clear that California was going to lead that way. Uh, we were in a transition when, when Obamacare was passed into law between a Republican governor and a Democratic governor. Schwarzenegger was going out and Jerry Brown was coming in. And we actually needed both of those governors from two different parties to support uh, an aggressive implementation and enrollment effort. We needed Schwarzenegger to the nation to create the state exchange, which he did. And then we needed Jerry Brown to quickly pick up the ball and do an aggressive outreach program. So we really went right to the people to build the kind of political support and public support for two governors to act like that. And we did that in partnership with uh, media partners, especially Spanish language media partners, helped us reach a lot of Californians. Uh, and that direct communication to people who would benefit, they and their fam families, really um, changed the atmosphere out here. While Washington and a lot of parts of the country were, st were still arguing about the death panels and all of those uh, pieces of misinformation out here, we kind of moved forward with what's good for California, what will people get? How do we get that information to them? And then the politicians kind of followed. So it sounds like it was really a collaboration, a, a team effort with a lot of people on the ground, right? Yeah, it is. And we gave that campaign a name, which is Asegurite. And there, I think there's a URL that you can click on to see kind of what that campaign with the media partners and grassroots organizers um, all around the state looks like. Thank you so much. Um, we know that uh, California has definitely led the way, and so we're, we're excited to see how other states can apply these best practices, and um, we'll look forward to seeing those changes in the next enrollment period. Um, moving on to our, our next question, Ramuel asks, going into this year, 2014, I enrolled in employer-provided health insurance. How is my coverage affected by the Affordable Care Act? Um, in other words, we know that 8 million people received new health plans through this law and um, almost 5 million enrolled through Medicaid and CHIP, but how did the law affect those who already had insurance? Uh, Kashif, can you help us with that one? Sorry, I should unmute myself before I talk. Um, I think, so, when we're talking about uh, Medicaid, it, I think that B was going to actually address that question, the uh, enrollment and for Medicaid question. Um, no, that's that's no problem. I think you're talking uh, about grandfather plans, right, young buddy? Um, so I'm talking about, so, and I'm, I apologize for the confusion, how did the Affordable Care Act affect people who already had health insurance before the law started, uh, like through through their job um, or through a private health yeah. insurance company? How did the law oh, affect that, their coverage? Gotcha. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, so, so sorry. I just want to, I, I think this, uh, that's a good opportunity to highlight the many provisions of the Affordable Care Act right now that impact and improve private plan affordability and coverage. And so to some extent, people's plans aren't going to change a whole lot and that's because some of these improvements have sort of already gone into effect. For example, uh, earlier we mentioned that certain preventive services including birth control are now required to be covered without copay or deductible. So people's plans, people's private plans now um, must cover those services. Um, another difference that people will see in their plans is that um, so any insurance plan that already offers dependent coverage must offer the same level of coverage at the same price um, to dependents under 26. So this means that young adults can stay on their parents' plans until age 26 um, if the plan offers dependent coverage, which is really great for those uh, folks who are just getting out of school, um, maybe they don't have a job that uh, offers employment. Um, and so uh, that's definitely a change that sort of already went into effect back in 2010. So some improvements uh, in insurance coverage uh, actually went into effect this year, 2014. So for example, the elimination of gender rating. So before the law, women could be charged more for individual and small employer insurance policies um, just because they're women, just because of their gender. Um, insurers are no longer able to charge women higher premiums under the new law. They can't charge women more than they charge men. 
So being a woman is no longer treated like a, a pre-existing condition under the plan. So those are just a few facets of the law that affect people's coverage. If they're, you know, if they're staying on the same plan, their plan might be covering more things and becoming more affordable for them. Great, thank you. Um, those are those were a lot of changes, and one of them that you mentioned um, that went into effect in 2010, I think you said, is that those who are 26 can stay on their parents' health insurance plans um, until well until the or until they're 26, I should say. Yeah, until the 26. <laughs> yeah. I was actually one of those. I remember I was so excited to get back on my health my parents' health insurance plan, and I, I went home to Utah, got all my checkups. It was really great. So I, I'm personally one of the ones who has benefited from that <laughs> already. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much, Kashif. Okay, so our next question um, comes from someone who asks, I was unemployed and uninsured on March 31st, which is when the, the deadline was to be signed up for health insurance. I am now employed, and my health coverage starts on July 1st. Do I have to pay a penalty for the three months I was uninsured this year? Maida, what's the answer to that one? Uh, that's a great question, and I think there's a lot of confusion around there about that penalty and who qualifies uh, for an exemption from the penalty, or who has to pay it when they file their taxes in 20 um, in 2015 for 2014. It's important to know that if there is a gap of coverage that's less than three months, they don't have to worry about uh, paying that penalty. You actually qualify for that exemption. Um, and actually, you don't even need to apply for the exemption. Um, you don't have to worry about it at all. There's a, a grace period of sorts because things happen. You you may lose your job or you move out of a, a from a different state. So there is this period of, of less than three months that you will not be penalized for not having that coverage. So they don't have to worry about it. Thank you, Maida. That's really good to know. So, for example, um, someone who's graduated from college and maybe isn't on their student health plan anymore and, and is unable to get covered through their parents' plan, and that person's still looking for a job, for example, um, they have a three-month gap to, to figure out what to do, <laughs> what to do next. Um, that's helpful um, because I know these, these things are, are a little complicated sometimes. Uh, thanks for explaining that, Maida. Um, sure. Our next question from James is kind of the reverse, actually. Um, he says, I had health coverage through my job during the enrollment period, but I've recently lost my job and I no longer have health insurance. What are my options now? Uh, B, can you, can you explain a little bit more about what, what his options are? Yeah, definitely. Um, so under the Affordable Care Act, there is the thing called special enrollment period. And like Mina was saying, things happen. And um, uh, such as in James' circumstance, um, you need to have a qualifying life event. In this particular case, is losing your health coverage because you've lost your job. Um, other qualifying events could include marriage or divorce, having a child, moving, residence, and also gaining citizenship. Um, if you think that you would qualify for the special enrollment, which it sounds like James might, um, you can start a marketplace application. So you can go to um, healthcare.gov and start an application and make sure that um, you denote that you think you qualify for special enrollment. And then you can also apply via phone. Um, you can call 1-800-318-2596. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, and just make sure that you let the individual know that you think you qualify for special enrollment. The one um, thing that I will do stress is that um, individuals have uh, 60 days from the day of the event um, in order to complete this process. So we encourage everybody, um, as soon as a qualifying live event happens, to start um, applying once again. Great. Um, thanks so much, B. And then um, you actually touched on a little bit on what the next question um, was, the next question was, aside from losing one's job, uh, what are some of the other circumstances that would trigger a special enrollment period? Um, Maida, is there anything to add to what B already elaborated for us? Ab absolutely. I think uh, B did a great job of talking about those circumstances that could trigger things. Um, and just to build on that uh, again is, you know, if, if there is something that happens in, in someone's life, they should at least try and figure out if they qualify for that special enrollment period. Because you might not only qualify um, for a new plan, 
but if you have existing coverage, for example, and something happens, you could qualify for more tax credit so that your coverage is cheaper, or you may qualify for cost-sharing reductions. There's always something that, would, that may happen. So when you're thinking about life events, think big. So getting married, or having a baby, or adopting a child, or becoming a new citizen, or gaining, or losing a dependent. Those are all things that could happen. In addition to moving out of state, or if someone loses their student coverage because they graduated, um, these are all opportunities that trigger that special enrollment period that B was talking about, and that also trigger that 60-day qualification. You've got to be able to do it within that 60-day period. Um, but there, there's other reasons that you know, your coverage may change as far as the, the cost of that coverage, and those are those light changes. Um, so it's important to consider what those may, may mean for you when it comes to the cost of, of your coverage. And that could be something like a change in your tax filing status or a cha uh, getting a new job or, or even getting a promotion at your job that changes your income. That may impact your coverage. So it's important to consider what those life changes mean when it comes to your health insurance. And the safest bet is to go to the health insurance marketplace um, if that's where your, your coverage is from and try and figure out how those changes impact you and your coverage. When you say, um, you mentioned changes to your tax status, what would that be? What would be a change to my tax status? So if you got married, you're now uh, filing jointly versus as a single. Um, that's one change, for example. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Daniel, welcome back. We, we dropped you off for a minute. Glad that's OK. It's good to be back. You came. You came just in time. I have a question for you. <laughs> um, we've been talking a little bit about the different circumstances in a person's life that might trigger a special enrollment uh, period, such as marriage or turning 26 and getting off your ha parents' health plan, um, changing a job, having a child, becoming a citizen, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I wondered if you just had anything to add about um, Medicaid coverage uh, and enrollment since that's ongoing. Well, that's, yeah, that's a really important point right there is that even though there was a lot of news coverage about the enrollment period ending, that's not true for Medicaid or what we call Medi-Cal here in California. That's year-round. So lower income people and people eligible for Medicaid should know that they can keep enrolling. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that um, if you're in a mixed immigration family, you know, maybe someone's eligible and other people aren't because of their immigration status, it's important that people not be afraid to enroll the people who are eligible. We've, we found out in our community work that a lot of people are afraid that uh, if they interact with the government on this, that information might be turned over to um, Homeland Security for deportation. And the president himself has assured that none of that will happen, no information sharing um, between the Obamacare enrollment. And, uh, and immigration services. So that's important for people to know. Obamacare did leave out people who are undocumented, which is a big problem here in California because we have a million point four people who are uninsured and don't yet have their immigration status. Um, so we're working on that out here too. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for adding that. And you know, I do remember that promise that the president made during um, during a town hall. So thanks for, for reminding of that. It's, it is really important for us to make sure that our community knows that that they needn't be afraid to get health coverage for their family members who do qualify. Um, speaking of things in the news, uh, we have a question. Uh, Kasha, if I'm hoping you can help us with this one. This person says, I've heard a lot in the news lately about employers not wanting to cover birth control for their employees in their health plans. What are they in required to cover for their employees? Kasha? Well, I think we're having a few technical difficulties. Um, could maybe one of our other panelists help us out with this one? I can. I'm happy to to to, to try. Uh, Thanks, Martha. So it, it, absolutely. So Kasha uh, talked about this a little bit earlier, but the Affordable Care Act requires um, health insurance plans to cover a set of services um, for women, and in particular for women across their lifespan. We know that the majority of women in this country uh, utilize contraception, 
And it's important to know that uh, the Affordable Care Act actually covers those contraceptive services and counseling um, to make it available for them. And the plans that are offered through the health insurance marketplace, this is part of that package of services, that package of preventive services that are available to people. But in, in particular, for this particular set, um, there's no cost sharing requirement. I think the cost of, of contraception often was a barrier for women that wanted to access either birth control pills or some other form of contraceptives to help them with their family planning. Um, now they don't have to worry about cost as a barrier and they have opportunities to access that. There are some questions about um, employers who may not be interested in offering that coverage because it's not in line with, with their religious ideals and beliefs. Um, and the, the Obama administration has definitely been mindful of that conversation. Um, we've issued a, a number of changes to the regulations associated with coverage of certain women's preventive services like contraception. Um, so it's important for the person who's considering picking a plan to make that educated decision. Um, it's important also to know that this does apply to non-grandfather plans. So it's those plans um, that existed after the Affordable Care Act was passed. If they existed before the law, they don't necessarily have to cover these preventive services as part of the package. Um, and there's a lot of misinformation out there about what is and isn't covered. And the best thing to do is to get informed and have a better understanding of what that package is. Healthcare.gov is a tremendous resource and provides a lot of that information and those details, as well as additional links. And I'm sure Kasha, if he gets back, um, can share uh, resources that his organization supports that can lend even more information. Thanks so much for filling in, Maida. Um, we're working on getting Kashif back on, so hopefully he'll be able to join us shortly. Um, but you brought up a lot of really good points. Um, I think also one thing to remember is um, that some of this might change depending on what the courts say, but it's, it's a really hard issue as Americans. Uh, we value freedom of religion very, very dearly you know, in our First Amendment. Uh, but also you have to balance that with the fact that Contraception isn't just used to prevent births. Uh, many women use it for, for other health purposes, and so it's important to, to keep that in mind as well. Um, Kashif, welcome back. Hi. So sorry. It looks like I got <laughs> dropped from the call, and it was a bit of a struggle to get back, but I'm here. No uh, problem. So where are we at? Did we, co did we cover the Hobby Lobby case? Um, Maida gave so. us a little bit of insight on that. She did a really great job filling in, um, but if you have anything you'd like to add or um, any resources from your organization, um, please please do so now. Sure, well, absolutely. I'd love to add uh, two things. One is just another uh, group of cases in the court to keep an eye on right now, and the other is please feel free to go to advocatesforyouth.org. We have um, fact sheets, we have blogs uh, that will give you more information about this topic. Um, and thank you, Myra, so much for filling in about the for-profit cases. I want to kind of zoom in on uh, the nonprofit cases. So there are several religiously affiliated nonprofit organizations right now that are also challenging the new health care law on religious grounds in the courts. And those cases are a little bit more confusing, and I'm not going to go into sort of what they technically are about, but basically um, there are already... so the the groups that are challenging the law are already exempt from paying for birth control coverage and the organizations simply object to the process of opting out and passing the cost of birth control to other entities. But the bottom line about these cases is that it's less clear how the decisions in the cases will impact access to affordable contraception for employees and students, um, especially you know, employees of religiously affiliated nonprofits or students that go to um, universities that are religiously affiliated. So that's another uh, group of cases to watch. Um, yeah. Thanks, Kashif. I'm glad you were able to hop back on just in time. <laughs> Me and, too. Uh, so it's a it's a complicated issue, and I guess we'll we'll have to wait and see what the what the courts decide and how that will impact um, existing plans. Um, Daniel touched a little bit a moment ago about undocumented immigrants and their um, role, or I guess lack thereof, in um, the Affordable Health Care Act in most, most states. And our next question comes from Ruth in California, actually, who asks, uh, with regard to undocumented immigrants, we know they don't qualify for coverage in the health marketplace. 
but for income tax purposes, how can they verify their legal status to avoid paying the penalty? Um, I had to read this question a couple of times, but um, what I believe what she's asking is um, if you're undocumented and you are and you file taxes, how do you how do you prove that you are undocumented so you don't get a fine in your taxes next year? Um, Daniel, um, can you help us with this one a little? Yeah, and, and Myra might be able to offer um, some information too, but the bottom line people need to know is uh, undocumented people are not covered by Obamacare, and so they're not subject to the fine for not having coverage. So um, that is one thing that undocumented people shouldn't worry about. But Myra, is there more we could tell people about that? Yeah, definitely. That That's a, a great fact that should be known, obviously. Um, uh, but building on what Daniel said, I think it's important to know that there are questions still about how information is going to be reported when someone files their taxes in 2015. Um, so just as a reminder, the Affordable Care Act requires that every person that can afford it should have um, this health insurance. There's an individual responsibility requirement. And that's honestly to understand that everyone contributes to our health care system, the people that have insurance and the people that don't. If you don't have insurance and something happens to you like a car accident or something horrific and you go to the hospital and use the emergency room and you can't pay, you know, that ends up having to be paid for somehow. It's uncompensated care, it raises tax dollars. So somehow that care, that medical care is going to be paid for. And it's often obviously shifted onto the cost of everybody else. That's why there's this responsibility, this shared responsibility for all of us to have health insurance so that we're protected. Think about having car insurance. If you get in a car accident with someone, you want to make sure that they have um, car insurance so that they can make sure that they pay for any kind of um, scratches and, and air, uh, mistakes that are made to your car, right? Similar with our bodies. This is what we're taking care of. So when it comes to the um, everybody, that that's the responsibility. But for undocumented immigrants, like Daniel said, that requirement um, is not part of the law. You don't have to worry about it. Um, but there are undocumented immigrants who actually file taxes using a taxpayer identification number. Right now, the forms for filing your taxes and making sure that you prove you have health insurance are being constructed by the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS. Those are the folks that make those forms available. Um, but bottom line, I think it's important to know that we are exploring ways in which people that qualify for an exemption can access it and not worry about it. Um, we understand the sensitivities around documentation um, and undocumented immigrants and, and that um, culture of fear that may still exist. So we want to make sure it's done so in a way that takes into consideration those situations while still allowing them to qualify for this important exemption so they don't have to worry about the cost of the penalty. Um, so stay tuned for more information, but folks should definitely know that for coming forward and putting whatever information you do put in the marketplace, they don't have to be fearful of immigration enforcement. You know, a lot of people are surprised to hear um, the, what, what Myra just said about the taxes that undocumented people pay. In California, undocumented Californians pay about $2.7 billion in taxes every year. Um, so from our point of view, at the endowment, it's actually not fair that they're contributing um, in the form of taxes but not eligible for Obamacare. So we're trying to figure out if there are ways as a state that we can actually include all Californians in coverage. And there's some interesting conversations going on out here about that. That's great. Um, those are some great, uh, great first steps. And thank you to both of you for answering a, a complicated question in, um, in such a great way. Um, we're, we'll move on to our, our next question. Um, and this one comes from A. Samudio, who asks, why can't I get the same coverage as folks in cheaper states? Um, again, the, the plans that were available through the health insurance marketplace vary depending on where you lived and um, on your income, but B, is there anything else we can add to, to help answer this question? Yeah, definitely, Anne-Lady. This reminds me of a conversation that I have with my parents almost on a monthly basis. I live in D.C., they live in California. My rent is almost twice as much as what my parents pay for their mortgage. Um, and so I can definitely sympathize with um, Asa Mudio on paying a little bit more for insurance versus other states. Um, what I would recommend to folks is um, if they qualify right now under the special enrollment period under Medicaid or CHIP um, to do so, um, 
If you do Medicaid CHIP, uh, you're able to um, either receive it at a free or a low cost. Um, so please try to use those avenues. And um, if you qualify under special enrollment due to um, a life event, um, please look at the plans and see something that covers your adequate health needs, but it works with your budget as well, because I, I can understand that concern. Oh, so sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, thanks so much, B. And I can definitely relate to um, to the fact that our rent out here in the D.C. area is so much more. Um, and it's it's just the same for your health plan. It all depends on, on where you live and what's offered in your area. And see, I'm from Utah, so the mortgage at my family home in Utah is a lot cheaper for sure than out here at things in D.C. <laughs> um, okay, so actually... Um, the same person had a, a, a follow-up question. Um, he said, I was insured before the Affordable Care Act took place. Why did my health plan change? Uh, Maida, can you help shed a little bit of light on this question? Yeah, sure. Um, and there's definitely a lot of confusion about you know, health insurance plans that existed before the law and health insurance plans that are now available in the marketplace and outside of the marketplace. So. Um, uh, I think it's a great question, and I think a lot of folks are, are wondering the same thing. Um, so uh, bottom line, I think there could be three situations that happened when a uh, current insurance plan ends. One, that plan could be canceled, and you have other options. Two is your plan is going to change to include those new rights and protections that we talked about earlier, like no lifetime limits on your coverage or those preventive services. Or three, you're going to have a chance to renew that plan without the rights and protections. Um, and that's something that we, we provided as an option for folks that uh, potentially wanted to keep their plan um, that existed before the law. Um, so if the insurance company decides to cancel your policy, but like it sounds with Aza Muyo, that's what happened, um, one thing that you could do is buy a, a health insurance plan another one that that same company offers. Oftentimes when they send that cancellation letter, they inform the consumer about other health insurance options. It may cost more, it may cost less, there is different opportunities, um, but generally that insurance company will offer other plans in its place. The other option is to go to the health insurance marketplace. Like we talked about with those special enrollment periods, if your plan is canceled or if your plan year ends, for example, in August of 2014, that triggers that special enrollment period. So you have the opportunity to go to the marketplace and look at your multiple options of health insurance plans that have different prices, that um, are different networks of providers, so you can make that choice and, and pick the best plan based on you and your needs. But the other option is to go outside the marketplace. For example, you know, one of the main benefits of the marketplace is that you have access to those tax credits to help make that coverage more affordable. But if you know you're not going to qualify for those tax credits, you might want to go outside of the marketplace. And guess what? The plans that are sold outside of the marketplace are just as strong. They have to cover those essential health benefits. They have to not have lifetime limits so that you know your insurance will be there when you need it the most. So there are multiple options made available to you. And as a result of making sure that people knew they have these options, we also made an additional option available. If, um, for example, if the plan has been canceled and you can't afford a marketplace plan to replace it, you can actually apply for a hardship exemption so that you won't be subject to the penalty. And in addition to that, you can buy what we call a catastrophic plan. We're going to talk about that a little bit more, but generally catastrophic plans allow you to, to pay all of your medical costs up to a certain amount, um, which is usually several thousand dollars. Um, and it has lower premiums and things to that effect. The idea is that you have options for coverage, that because your plan was canceled doesn't mean you don't have any other options for health insurance coverage. And hopefully with, with our talk today and with access to different resources like healthcare.gov, you'll be able to know what that next step will be. Thanks so much, Maida. Um, B, can you help us with the next question? This sure. question comes from Maria. So I mentioned um, that of the 8 million Americans who signed up for health insurance, many are using insurance for the very first time, and we're excited for the opportunity that they have now. Um, but her question is, do I need to see my primary doctor before I see a specialist? 
Thanks, Anthony. Um, I'd advise that um, she check with her insurance company. It's important that individuals check with their insurance company to see what their plan covers and doesn't cover. Unfortunately, I can't uh, provide a specific uh, answer for Maria, but what I can do, uh, what I can recommend is um, if you visit healthcare.gov, um, the administration has put this program called Coverage to Care. As you mentioned, there's a lot of individuals who are newly insured and don't necessarily know what health insurance means or how to use their um, insurance card, how to visit a doctor for the very first time. So I'd recommend that they go to the website um, to get a little bit more information about how their insurance works and finding um, health care providers. So in short, um, ask your health insurance about um, any particular questions that you might have. Each plan is different. Um, but there are resources. Um, I know we have a, a great uh, infographic that breaks down what's a premium, what's a, a deductible. Um, just these are terms that folks may not be familiar with if they've never been insured. And um, I'll be sure to link that that link um, in this video once it's posted on YouTube. Um, our next question, um, Kasha, if, if you'll help us with this one. Um, this gentleman asked, my wife and I signed up for Obamacare and paid for two months of health coverage. Unfortunately, the plan didn't provide the type of coverage my wife needed for her health problems, and we canceled our plan. Now we don't have health insurance. What can we do? Tasha, what are their options? So that's a good question. Um, and before we talked about losing coverage for certain reasons, and now we're talking about voluntarily canceling uh, your plan. So unfortunately, if you cancel your plan, you can't go back on the marketplace to shop. You have to purchase a new plan on your own. Um, off the marketplace, which unfortunately means those subsidies, those tax credits um, will not be available. Um, so we recommend that you don't cancel your plan. Um, instead, uh, you should wait for the next enrollment period uh, and stick it out. So there is an exception, as we talked about, which are special enrollment periods, um, which, which means that if you have undergone the qual a qualifying life event, you may be able to to enroll outside of open enrollment, but unfortunately, as, as I said, um, canceling coverage voluntarily does not constitute a qualifying life event, um, and so you'll, be, you'll have to go outside of the marketplace to get insurance. Got it. Um, that's, a, that's a tough spot to be in, um, but for the next enrollment period, it's a, um, it's a good idea to research ahead of time. You can even call insurance companies and ask these questions before um, choosing a plan, just to be sure that the coverage that you're getting is, is actually the coverage that you need. Um, thanks so much, Kasha, for helping Absolutely. us with that hard question. Um, our next question comes from Lasado, who says, when my family tried to apply for health coverage, we were told we qualify for Medi-Cal, so another California question. Um, but we've never asked for government assistance, and we don't want to be dependent on the government for our health care. Do we have any other affordable health care options? Um, Daniel, what would you say to Lazaro and his family? Well, I think the first thing I would say is if, uh, if you qualify for Medi-Cal, that means that you deserve Medi-Cal. It's there for all of us uh, at a time of need. And um, Lazaro, you and your family are paying taxes every day, even when you don't know it. Every time you buy anything, you're paying taxes. And uh, what we do as a society is we use some of those taxes for those times when any of us might need help having health coverage. That's what Medicaid and Medi-Cal are for. Uh, they have a really good benefits program. It doesn't have to be forever, but uh, it's really actually doing the right thing to take advantage of, of what you deserve in that case because, as uh, I think Myra was saying earlier, if you're without coverage, someone's going to end up picking up the cost, and sometimes not in the best way, sometimes in the emergency room or um, places that are more expensive, not as good for you and not as good for, for the system. So um, I would just encourage anyone who's qualified for Medi-Cal to understand that um, that's the right thing to do, and, and you're paying for it. And, you know, hopefully it'll help you um, have more success in the future so you'll make more money um, to help support Medi-Cal for the next people who need it. Absolutely. Um, thank you for highlighting that. Um, our taxes pay for so many things. They pay for roads, highways, and, you know, we wouldn't stop driving down the highway or walking on the sidewalk. Um, and so for Lazaro and his family, I would just echo what Daniel said. Um, if your family is needing health coverage and that's an option that's extended to you, um, that's such a great opportunity, and I would really encourage you all to take advantage of that. Um, thanks, Daniel, for helping us with that one. 
Um, our next question um, is, a, is one that a lot of people are wondering. Um, again, repeating that number, 8 million people were able to enroll for health insurance, 4.7 million in Medicaid and CHIP, uh, but there might be some people out there who missed the deadline. Uh, B, what happens to people who didn't sign up for health insurance by March 31st, by, by that enrollment deadline? Sure. Um, so if you're uninsured and you're uneligible to enroll um, until November, most likely you'll have to pay a tax or a fine um, in 2015. I believe the fine is about $95 or 1% of your annual income, whichever is greater. Um, for consumers without affordable options, um, those in the Medicaid gap, meaning um, they would qualify for Medicaid if their states were to expand, um, can, ap um, can apply for coverage through the marketplace and they can get an automatic exemption. And then additionally, there come a period where you can actually apply uh, for an exemption itself. Great. Um, thank you so much. Um, again, that's a, an important question. I know a lot of people are probably wondering that. So thanks so much, Fee. Um, our next question, um, Daniel, I um, hope you can help us with this one. Um, Marilyn wonders when uh, or if will there be another round to sign up for health coverage? There will be for the state exchanges um, and for the federal exchange and again for Medicaid or in our state Medi-Cal, uh, signups are year-round. So they're going on right now. So for millions of people who are still eligible, um, you should first find out if you're eligible for Medicaid when you can enroll anytime. And if not, there'll be another enrollment period uh, for everyone else in the fall. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. There will be another enrollment period for those who weren't able to sign up this time around. So um, stay tuned in the fall. <laughs> All right, our next question, um, Maida, this one, um, this one's a little bit different. Uh, so many people have heard of the motor voter law. This was passed um, in the 90s and says that anywhere that there's a government service offered, that there also needs to be a way provided for folks to register to vote, which is why when we go to the DMV, we have the option to register to vote, uh, hence the name motor voter law. Um, and with the, the health care marketplaces being an example um, of a government provided service, uh, there's a requirement to have that option. Maida, um, we got a question that asks, where can I register to vote on the health insurance marketplace? Yeah, sure. It's a, it's a great question and people often ask um, how the two are related, so you did a great job of explaining that, Yamadi, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, it is part of the application when someone is applying for health insurance and using the health insurance marketplace to get their coverage. Step six on the application actually provides information about where that individual can register to vote. Perfect. Thank you, Maida. Um, so it, it looks like it's not available right off the bat, but it's embedded into the application process. Um, exactly. Thank you. And Daniel, I know in California um, there's, there are additional efforts being done uh, to comply with this. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think this is really important because um, a lot of the people who have been uninsured are, are the same people who are eligible to vote but have not been registered. And I think that's important that we close that gap for two reasons. One is, um, you know, there's been a lot of controversy and criticism of the new law. And so we think the people who are actually experiencing it when they enroll should have a say in the political future of it. So if they don't like what they're getting, they should be able to say that um, at the ballot box. And I think most people actually, um, when they experience health coverage, are, are going to like that and should also have a say in preserving its future. Programs like Medicare and Social Security have survived for decades because the people who enrolled in those programs are also voting in great numbers and often vote to defend those programs. So in California, we actually sent out 4 million pieces of mail to people who had newly enrolled um, households where their people had, had newly enrolled under the new law um, with voter registration form for them to register to vote too. And I think we already have about a quarter of a million people who registered during that period of time that the mailing went out. And we hope a lot more will because um, it's it, for a society to be healthy, you also have to have a healthy democracy. That's part of it. Absolutely. That's, wow, quarter million, that's a lot. <laughs> um, at Voto Latino, voter registration is our, our bread and butter. That's an issue we definitely feel passionate about. And I really like how you made the connection between voting and um, laws like the Affordable Care Act. Um, 
at Voto Latino, we've been around for 10 years, and we um, obviously feel very passionate, like, like Daniel does, about making sure that folks are registered to vote, that they have a say in the way that, they're, that, that our country is being run. Um, but it's important to, to make that connection on, on a personal level and to see how the way that you vote and the people for whom you vote affect the, the way that your, your life runs day to day. Um, so, for example, I mentioned that, that I was able to get coverage on my, my parents' health plan um, until I turned 26. Um, I know that that law has directly impacted me, and I know that a lot of, a lot of you who are listening have been impacted as well. So um, keep in mind that, that voting and registering to vote is important, but it does have a real impact. It's um, sometimes discouraging. You feel like your vote might not matter, but it does. It really does, and it's important um, to register to vote. And in the video, again, we'll include a link to register to vote um, right here. So if you're watching this after the live hangout, um, be sure to click on that and make sure that your voter registration is up to date. Thank um, you for all that you guys are doing at Voto Latino on uh, getting people registered to vote. We really appreciate you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being such great partners, all of you, and, and helping us with that effort. Um, okay, Kasha, for our next question comes from a concerned mother who asked us, uh, my daughter is 21 and in college, and she doesn't have health insurance. She doesn't qualify for Medicaid because she lives in Texas, uh, and Texas was one of the states that didn't expand Medicaid coverage. I only work part-time, earning $7.50 an hour, and the health insurance I get through my job only provides coverage for me. What options do we have for her? I think Kashif's screen's a little bit frozen right now. <laughs> <laughs> is there someone who'd that be willing help. to Thanks. <laughs> no problem. Um, it's important, obviously. I think anyone of us that either has a daughter or a baby sister like myself, who is also 21, uh, we worry about them and making sure that they can be as healthy as they can be and can think about their next steps in their career. So I'm sure this mom is very concerned and wants to protect her, 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 her daughter. Um, so there's a variety of opportunities. So obviously um, she can access Sometimes she can access student insurance through her university or through her college, so that's an option she may want to explore. Um, in addition to that, because she's 21, she actually qualifies for a catastrophic coverage. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but catastrophic plans um, are specifically targeted for either people um, of lower income or those that are under 30 years of age. It's often what people consider um, plans for like the young invincibles who may think that they are invincible and nothing's ever going to happen. What the idea is is that you're protected from any large amount of, of medical coverage that you may need that may be really expensive. So you never know if you're going to get in a serious car accident or if you're going to have a serious diagnosis and accrue a lot of accrue a, a, a huge medical um, bill. So as a result of that, this catastrophic plan will offer you the coverage that you need at an affordable price. It's generally lower monthly premium so that you can have that protection. Um, in addition to that, obviously she has access to community health centers. The Affordable Care Act invests $11 billion in community health centers in states like Texas and across the country to not only create new health centers that offer important services to everyone regardless of their ability to pay, but also to expand services at existing health centers so that they can offer that full continuum of care. And then finally, just one thing that she should know, because she lives in Texas and Texas has decided to not expand Medicaid, and as a result of that is leaving um, tens of thousands of people out because they don't have this opportunity for coverage, she wouldn't um, have to risk having to pay a penalty because people that live in states that choose not to expand Medicaid uh, and they're otherwise eligible actually qualify for that exemption. So hopefully um, with these options, her daughter will have the opportunity to get coverage. Uh, but in case not, she doesn't have to worry about having to pay that penalty. Ah, muted again. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Maida. So um, in conclusion, there, there are options. That catastrophic plan is um, such a, a great opportunity, uh, again, people who are maybe newly out of college or still in college, budgets are tighter, um, great to have that option. And I know there's also, uh, might I mentioned the exemption, uh, I know there's a, a link to find out information about that, so we'll be sure to add that um, to this video as well. Uh, our next question, what about recent college grads over age 26, uh, which means that they couldn't be on their parents' health plan anymore, 
And what about these college grads who are required to get health coverage but don't know which state they'll be living in? Uh, maybe they haven't found a job yet or in the process of moving. Can you opt in and out or switch plans according to state? Uh, this question comes from Edna. And Maida, can you help us with this one as well? Yeah, sure. And it's related to the previous one, right? I think, you know, for young adults across the country, whether you're graduating high school or college, you know, you're really focused on what's that next step in my life? What's my next career step? Or perhaps you want to start a family or you want to get married. Those are important life decisions. And you want to have the security that comes with health insurance just in case something happens. Um, so that's what the, the marketplace, that's what the concepts behind the Affordable Care Act are all about is providing options for coverage so that you can focus on the other things that matter in life. Like for many young adults, it's what that next step in their life is going to be. Um, so for, the, for Edna and the questions that she has, if she moves out of state and loses her coverage or perhaps loses her student coverage, that is what we talked about as far as a life event, a triggering life event, which would qualify her for a special enrollment period so that she can then go to the marketplace and shop for coverage on the marketplace and still have access to tax credits to ensure that it's affordable so long as she you know, makes the right, um, is, uh, qualifies for the tax credits. Um, that's exactly what that is. It qualifies her for that special enrollment period. Or if she moves to a state that expands Medicaid, perhaps she's eligible for Medicaid. The opportunities um, hopefully are, are endless for folks that are in these situations, whether it's moving out of state or changing jobs or losing your job, um, you want to have the opportunity to access affordable health insurance so that you can then focus on whatever um, next priority there is in your life. Thanks, Maida. Appreciate that. Um, our next question is from Eduardo who is wondering whether DACA applicants or those who have deferred action status, um, sometimes we know them better as dreamers, are they required to have health insurance or is it only required for legal permanent residents and citizens? Daniel, can you hear? Oh, is that for me? Sorry. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Just for anybody who's, uh, who's on who doesn't know, uh, Dreamers or DACA youth are um, people who, who were brought here as children but don't have their immigration uh, documentation. And um, in California, I can speak about California, we've actually made some special provisions in state law so that uh, they are eligible for the state-funded Medicaid or what we call Medi-Cal here. Um, and we've made other provisions for DACA youth too. But, um, but even in California, that still leaves 1.4 million undocumented people who are not in that category of DACA dreamers um, who, again, pay taxes, contribute to the economy, but don't have any options for affordable coverage. So um, there's an effort underway out here to, to close that gap so that we can actually have it be coverage for all. Obamacare is a great start for our state, um, and we think we can actually finish the job. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate highlighting highlighting the efforts that are being done in California um, and hopefully soon we'll be able to see expansion like that in other places as well. Um, so I know we've gone a couple minutes over so we'll we'll wrap up and I just want to thank each and every one of our panelists. I think we lost Kashif again but Kashif wherever you are we're glad you were on. Thank you Daniel, thank you B, thank you so much Maida for being with us today and um, we had we had one last question. I'll just go through this one really quickly uh, this one is, if I'm going to be penalized this year, what is the penalty period? Does the fine cover from April, April 1st of this year to March 31st of next year, or what, what's, what does it cover? And um, just really quickly, the, the answer to that is that you have to have consistent coverage throughout the year. Might I mentioned earlier that there, there is that grace period of three months. So, for example, if you lose your job or you move and lose your health coverage um, or your status changes for some reason, you do have those three months to, uh, to get health coverage and um, avoid paying, uh, paying a penalty. But the penalty period will be um, for the duration of 2014. You'll see that. Um, hopefully you're not susceptible to that, but if, if by chance you are, um, that'll come in your taxes next spring. Uh, for 2014, uh, but the good thing is, is if you missed the opportunity to enroll this time around, uh, coming coming in November or um, in the autumn, depending on the state uh, where you live, you'll be, have the opportunity to sign up for health coverage again through the the online marketplaces. Um, 
So thank you again to everybody for being with us today. Thank you so much to everyone who submitted questions. Um, I can't stress enough how important your participation is to making sure that Voto Latino programs are um, are happening and are, are answering questions that, that real people have. Um, so I just want to thank everybody. Um, and uh, just throwing out one last reminder, if you're not registered to vote, um, keep in mind how these issues affect you on a day-to-day -day life, how they affect the people the people you love, your friends, your family, um, and just remember to register to vote. Thank you so much, everybody, and we'll see you on our next Hangout. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you.